Thank you, Len. Uh, okay, bon. uh, hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome you all to our third section of the, our uh, Global Bergsonism Web Seminar. Uh, before introduction, the introduction, introduction the section, I would like to thank some people. I am very grateful to Leonard Lauer, our host, to Frederick Worms, Katerina Zanfi, and all the other colleagues who built this research network, Global Bergsonism, and this obviously includes La Société des Amis de Bergson. I also extend my thanks to the University of Penn State its staff, and especially to Ted Bergsman. And uh, for, for our section three, sympathy, ethics, and aesthetics, Bergsonian approaches in dialogue. Let's start off by welcoming Melanie White and Miguel Bailey. Uh, we are very happy to have you both here and learn about more about your thoughts on some Bergsonian important Bergsonian issues, okay? And I will quickly introduce you and after Melanie will begin and uh, Miguel uh, will talk after. And after the presentations, we will open the space for the questions. Uh, Melanie White is Associate Professor in so Social Theory in the School of Social Sciences at University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. She edited Bergson on Politics and Religion with Alexander Lefebvre and has written on subjects of sociality, sympathy, and habit in Bergson's writing. Uh, Miguel José Pelli was born in Bogota, Colombia. We, he received his BA from the University of British Columbia in Canada. MA and MPhil degrees from the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium, and is currently a PhD student at the New School for Social Research in New York City. Miguel's work explores the relations among Bergson, phenomenology, phenomenology and process philosophy, with a particular focus on the ideas of affect, mind, and nature. I, I can, I, I, I think that uh, Melanie can begin. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, that introduction. And thank you so much for the invitation to speak with you here today. I'm joining you from Sydney, Australia, and I hope that wherever you are, you are happy and healthy. Um, here as elsewhere, I've been watching the events of the American election unfold and I want to acknowledge what a difficult time this must be and hope that it comes to a resolution soon. Um, my talk begins with a bit of a marvel and an apology. The marvel is that despite the fact of a global pandemic, travel restrictions and more, we are still able to come together in this forum and to discuss Bergson and his ideas. And the apology is that given the difference in time zones, it means that I can't actually enjoy the other discussions in real time, but I want to assure you that I'm going to uh, view the recordings, listen in and wish vicariously that I was there. The title of my paper is Bergson and Sympathy, and it begins with the observation that the word sympathy appears frequently through Bergson's oeuvre. We find it in creative evolution, where, for instance, he calls the instinct that causes a hunter to devour its prey a sympathy. This is a sympathy that expresses the unimmediateness of life living in relation to itself. In the immediacy of its action, this sympathy is unreflective. It acts. The word sympathy is also found in Bergson's last great work, The Two Sources of Morality and Religion, where it designates both a social relation and a moral feeling. Here, sympathy is expressed as a natural obligation that ties one to another through instinct, through an instinct for closure, pardon me, and self-preservation in the face of the enemy, 
This kind of natural sympathy is contrasted with what I have called a complete sympathy to designate that attitude of continuous change and a spirit of generosity, of love and care that reaches beyond the closure of a social group. The word appears elsewhere, and certainly Bergson was not the first to see the potential for sympathy to capture something of our moral relation to others. One only need to recall David Hume's commitment to the idea of a tender sympathy with others as the basis of moral life, or Adam Smith's conception of sympathy as the fellow feeling that grounds the social order. What I find so interesting about the way that Bergson employs the concept of sympathy is that it escapes both the sweetness and naivety commonly associated with claims to the fellow feeling of togetherness. It would seem that a webinar is not replete or complete without uh, sounds from the outside, I apologize. Um, in the jaws of the wasp and the attack against those who have become enemies, sympathy reveals a meanness. And yet the seeming absence of benevolence does not make his conception of sympathy any less moral. For the wasp must live and for it to live, it must resolve the problem of hunger. And in so doing, it lustily savors its caterpillar prey and just as sympathy easily expresses the tie between family and friends, and here I'm thinking of his argument in the two sources of morality and religion, by necessity it establishes a pathos of distance for those who lie beyond its warm embrace. What makes Bergson's conception of sympathy so powerful for me is the ambivalence that lies at the heart of this tender feeling. We can imagine in the experience of the wasp a tenderness that takes the form of a pleasure in the demise of its prey. This is a sympathy that is experienced as a lust for life, a pleasure in the enjoyment of another. It is similar to the pleasure we may have in celebrating our child's first words and first steps. What was for the wasp, a murderous instinct in the love for life, takes the form of vengeance to those who would wrest a child from its mother's arms and bring it harm. For Bergson, both examples are expressions of sympathy, but they do not help us when we are faced with a moral dilemma in which we are unsure of how we should act. His lesson for us is that an unreflective sympathy is ambivalent. But then the question is the extent to which the capacity for sympathy offers us the means to reflect and ultimately distinguish between merely living and living well. An attention to this distinction is at the heart of recent attempts by Keith Ansel Pearson, Alex Lefebvre, and many of you here today to develop a Bergsonian ethics. I would like to use the occasion of this paper to contribute to this ongoing conversation. I want to dwell on the different ways that Bergson invokes the experience of sympathy to bring into relief the difference between living and living well. The answer he gives us depends on the particular contours and textures of the text at hand. And so far, I acknowledge I've been speaking in rather general terms. And now I want to focus my remarks. I want to concentrate on the series of essays Bergson published in 1900 under the title Laughter. I do so for several reasons. First, the conception of sympathy he develops in these essays anticipate uh, the direction that he will have taken in the two sources of morality and religion, which he writes more than 30 years later. Second, laughter is directly concerned with the question of what distinguishes merely living from living well. This is a theme that comes to underpin the two sources, just as the two sources shows us that it is possible, at least in principle, for a hero, the mystic, to interrupt the habitual tendency to separate us from them. So too does laughter demonstrate the capacity for the comical to disrupt our sympathies. But where two sources is a joyful text, 
that expresses a love in life, laughter functions as a social corrective. Its purpose is to return us to our sociability. It has a pessimistic quality. To put the point sharply, in two sources, living well requires us to transcend our quotidian loves and hates. But in laughter, living well requires us to return to our usual sympathies. In short, in two sources, to live well demands an unsociability, whereas in laughter, living well requires our sociability. In this paper, I want to demonstrate that Bergson's appreciation of the conditions for living well changes in relation to how he conceptualizes sympathy as a social relation. Given time constraints, and given the pleasure of this audience, I, have the, I can make the assumption that you have some familiarity with Bergson and some familiarity with the argument that he presents in two sources. I work up the contrast he develops in laughter somewhat pragmatically, and this will be the focus of my uh, discussion today, in order to highlight the key contrasts in the way he conceptualizes sympathy. Central to my argument is that each text presents a distinct methodological approach that shapes his approach to sympathy and consequently informs his commitment to living well. So let us begin with laughter. Bergson's argument begins with the observation that the comical can only be understood from the vantage afforded by life. For to define the comic, would be to, quote, imprison the comic spirit, end quote. Accordingly, Bergson regards the comic spirit as a living thing. Quote, however trivial it may be, we shall treat it with the respect due to life, end quote. With the benefit of hindsight, we can see that a similar logic will have begun to take shape in the motivating problem of creative evolution namely the mutual enhancement of a theory of life and a theory of knowledge. Equally, the centrality of life as the basis for bearing on everyday experience anticipates the way he uses a theory of life to contribute to and develop a theory of morality in the two sources. But where these subsequent texts benefit from having already worked up a theory of life that has its origin in the dual tendencies of the actual and the virtual. In laughter, we have the identification, only the identification, of the mutually com complementary forces of tension and elasticity to ground the conception of life he begins to advance. Bergson establishes his methodological orientation early on in the text. He observes that the source of the comic is real life, and to the extent that it escapes the rudiment of the social, he suggests that it is akin to art. To this end, he asks, quote, begotten of real life and akin to art, should it not also have something of its own to tell us about art and life? Now, doing so allows him to establish that laughter is a lived experience. For how many of us have choked and burbled and gasped for air when confronted with the surprise of something funny, of something comical? There is a deeply embodied experience in the release found in the twitching of our shoulders, of tears and voluntarily streaming down our faces, and of the shaking of our bodies in laughter. Bergson's point is that laughter is not simply an individual experience. It is a deeply social relation. It is dependent on a group and dependent on a shared way of life. We need others to laugh with and at. We laugh with others when we perceive that a slice of the everyday has somehow become strange the sudden awareness of the repetitive verbal tics of a colleague or the peculiar oddities of a neighbor. We catch a glance, a signal, and then we laugh. We laugh when we come to perceive that the mechanical has encrusted itself on the living 
something has become rigid. It's laughter that marks the diversion and disruption of the smooth flow of life. Our attention is caught. No matter how trivial laughter might seem, for Bergson, it performs an important social function. It is a corrective. It is a sanction. It seeks to chide and in so doing brings back an errant individual to the social fold. For laughter is an expression of an awareness of something deeply unsociable and marks correspondingly a return to the sociable. I want to suggest that the experience of sociability here in laughter takes the form of a sympathy. That is a fellow feeling that is in tune with and in unison with life in the way that Bergson defines it here in this text. The experience of laughter marks out the fear of the abasement of society. Bergson remarks, quote, laughter appears to stand in need of an echo. Listen to it carefully. It is not an articulate, clear, well-defined sound. It is something which would fain be prolonged by reverberating from one to another, something beginning with a crash to continue in successive rumblings like thunder in a mountain. Still, this reverberation cannot go on forever. It can travel within as wide a circle as you please. The circle remains, nonetheless, a closed one. Our laughter is always the laughter of a group. In other words, laughter is a social corrective that chides the absent-minded or the odd or the peculiar and brings them back to the social fold. This is its function. Consequently, it is through the impertinence of the group, that is the group's laughter, that the impertinence of the individual, the one who denies or challenges the social is checked. But although laughter is a living thing for Bergson, it does not lend itself easily to living well. For laughter to do so, for it to be just and moral, it would need to be reflective and thoughtful. But this isn't how laughter works. There is here, as elsewhere for Bergson, a difference between living and living well. And it is here that Bergson establishes a difference in kind between life and society, one that he will subsequently break down into in two sources. Now, what is consistent in laughter, however, is the sense that society is structured by a tendency toward automatism on the one hand and another tendency toward a constant striving. Certainly, in two sources, the habitual is expressed as a tendency culminating in a pressure and a constraint to oblige, just as the experience of striving takes the form of an aspiration to spiritual transformation. But here in la laughter, these tendencies are not explicitly tendencies of life nor of society, but rather problems to be overcome. In the first instance, atominism Automatism threatens society because it resists growth and development. In other words, it is through ease that we stagnate. Ah, oh, life is good. We need no, do no more. But in the second instance, the push to a constant striving places an inordinate strain on the members of society such that we can no longer live well. Ah. Oh, I'm falling apart. I can't do this anymore. I'm going to stay in bed. Both orient us to a kind of somnambulism, a sleeping of the soul. Thus in laughter, to live well, we must not sleep, nor can we dream. Living well is not the domain of the individual. Rather, it is intensely social. It requires a constant attention to life that is here to sympathy understood as, quote, the increasingly delicate adjustment of wills that fit more and more, in, more perfectly into one another, end quote. 
Our challenge in living well is that we cleave toward automatism and toward immobility, but when our awareness is sparked, when our attention to life is ignited, when our sympathy deflects toward the mechanical, we have the conditions for laughter. What distinguishes Bergson's approach in laughter from the argument he later develops in two sources is that he begins from the livingness of the tangle of emotions that organizes everyday life. This is the livingness in which laughter resides. It is the composite of our experience. And here sympathy is a composite of the tendencies and, motion, and emotions that blur the conceptual lines of the virtual and the actual, the closed and the open, the mechanical and spiritual that are more sharply delineated in the two sources. This is perhaps why Vladimir Jankelevich observes that, quote, laughter thus always links up with the relation of two levels we sense to be scrambled, end quote. For Jankelevich, this is what Bergson gets at when he defines his intuition as a kind of sympathy. Every time our soul is in play, this demand for sympathy is there to remind philosophers that we are not dealing with just any problem, but with a debate in which we are wholly engaged, in which we are always at the same time judge and party, in which we have to relive, redo, and recreate instead of knowing. Laughter is again a corrective. It serves to sanction. It is the weapon that society uses against its members to pull them into order. For Bergson, quote, being intended to humiliate, it must make a painful impression on the person against whom it is directed. By laughter, society avenges itself for the liberties taken with it. It would fail in its object if it bore the stamp of sympathy or kindness, end quote. So laughter is not of sympathy, but it functions to return us to sympathy and to an attention to life. Bergson's point is reinforced by a lecture subsequently given in 1901, in which he reflects on the danger of somnambulism for living well. He says there, quote, in the waking state, we live our lives in common with our fellow beings. Attentiveness to this external social bond holds sway over the success of our internal states. The dreamer is no longer capable of the, quote, attentiveness to life, end quote, necessary for regulating the internal, the inner according to the outer, for fitting inner duration perfectly into the general duration of things, end quote. Now, it may be the case that many of us feel the impossibility of achieving the joy and the love in life to which the mystic draws us in two sources. And this is perhaps why and how Bergson's ethical pessimism and laughter can have its appeal. Maybe this is its lesson. Maybe our sociability is something that cannot and should not be taken for granted. It may be that our sympathy, our everyday fellow feeling, is oftentimes too fractured, too scarred. And what we need is a return to, a demand for, a cultivation of our sympathy that requires a return to associability in and of our relation with others. This perhaps explains why laughter is such a unifying force. It invigorates our sympathy for each other and awakens us from our slumbers. It draws our attention back to life. We feel alive as we laugh. But if we return to the distinction between living and living well, the question is not precisely, do we want to live or not? For this is neither 
a genuine dilemma, nor a real decision. I'm mindful here of the closing lines of two sources, quote, men do not sufficiently realize that the future is in their own hands. Theirs is the task of determining, first of all, whether they want to go on living or not. There's the responsibility then for deciding if they want merely to live or intend to make just the extra effort required for fulfilling even on their refractory planet, the essential function of the universe, which is a machine for the making of gods." End quote. Indeed, we do not require intuition to answer this question. That is, do we want to live? For we will always answer with a resounding yes. Even if we are aware of the deeper moral question, do we choose merely to live or to live well? Even if we are aware that living well requires us to move beyond our nature, sometimes living well might require us, as Bergson reminds us in laughter, to rediscover our nature, to rediscover our livingness, to rediscover our sympathy with others, and in so doing, to rediscover our nature. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Melanie, for this excellent presentation. Very exciting. I, I invite now Miguel to present his text. Okay, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Deborah and Len and all the organizers. It's really a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, on the topic of laughter, I realized I just sent a message to a friend who joined the, the attendees, and I think I sent it to all the panelists. So ignore that. <laughs> um, OK, but anyways, um, so my paper is called uh, Utility, Affect, and Self-Constitution. Uh, it's a Bergsonian reading of Levinas and Whitehead. I, I think I could also call this a Levinasian reading of Bergson or a Whiteheadian reading of Levinas or Bergson. It's, it's kind of somewhere in the middle, maybe nowhere. So as anyone studying Bergson today knows, the history of philosophy is quite fickle. The same thinker that can pack auditoriums all over the world during his lifetime can then be almost entirely forgotten in a few short decades. A thing or two changes, some books are published, and then for whatever reason, now here we are in something like the Global Bergsonism Project. With very few exceptions, so it goes with philosophers. For those lucky enough to be remembered at all, similar contingencies apply with regard to precisely how they are remembered. The theorist Max Tomba speaks of how we can read the history of philosophy in terms of a series of constellations. If the individual philosophers are stars, he says that we can think of the canon as the somewhat contingent selection of constellations that we draw in the night sky that we call philosophy. So today, when we learn and teach philosophy, when we seek to navigate philosophy, we are always guided by a series of very specific constellations. Plato, Platonists, the Stoics, Cartesians, Kantians and the post-Kantians, phenomenologists, vitalists, etc. All these various constellations guide our reading and our thinking in a very general way. But the point is, of course, that the constellations are largely artificial. The lines could be drawn differently. New connections could be made, and more importantly, new stars could be included in our thinking. This alternative canon, as Tomba calls it, allows us to place ideas and problems in a new light. And in a way, this is what I take to be the project of global Bergsonism in a certain sense. It's sort of a new mapping and perhaps a rediscovery of a place that is already familiar, often a bit too familiar. So in that spirit, my paper is a small attempt at outlining one such small three-part constellation made up of these three thinkers, Bergson, Levinas, and Whitehead. Now, although this is not a terribly new thought, as both Levinas and Whitehead are seen as related, if not to each other, then at least certainly to Bergson, I argue that the particular topic of affect and self-constitution can show new features of this connection. So with this goal in mind, my paper will have two parts. In the first part, I discuss Bergson's notion of self-constitution by focusing on a few key ideas, the notion of action, the notion of utility, and especially how this relation exists in the concept of affect. 
The notion of utility will lead me to Bergson's concept of nature, which will then set the stage for a discussion of the relationship between need and affect in this process of self-constitution. And my eventual claim here will be that Bergson, I think perhaps without realizing it, gives an account of a process of self-constitution that is based on affect, which however is somewhat at odds with his determination of nature as utilitarian. Then in the second part, I will very briefly trace some of the basic features of the metaphysics of both Whitehead and Levinas and show how these two seemingly very different thinkers are actually responding to the same problem in Bergson and they provide an almost identical solution. Both thinkers, that is, critique a utilitarian concept of nature such as Bergson's and in its place emphasize the role of affect as determining for self-constitution as I think Bergson does as well, sort of. Um, so I'll begin with part one, Bergson and self-constitution. For Bergson, it was a reflection on the empty temporality of the scientific thinking of his day that led him to abandon Spencerian philosophy and develop the notion of duration. Among other things, this fundamental insight means that Bergson's metaphysics is a metaphysics of becoming, indeed one of creative evolution. For Bergson, the human subject is not only of duration psychologically, although that is the extent to which it is first described in time and free will, but it is also itself as a living organism in duration. It is a creature of duration and thus in constant becoming. So much is made clear in matter and memory and creative evolution. And it is in this latter sense that I talk of self-constitution. Very generally, I take self-constitution to be the process by which the various functions or elements of the self come to be coordinated with one another. As Bergson at one point talks of the symphony of the body, we might here speak more generally of self-constitution as the process that attains the symphony of the self. But rather than provide a too detailed definition from the start, I hope to simply follow Bergson's own procedure and simply begin exploring this phenomenon to see what we might learn about it at the end. The symphonic metaphor is however, especially useful in discussing something like self-constitution for its stake is of course not the joining of separate elements. Time and free will makes clear that such atomism, psychological or otherwise, is out of the question. Rather, as with an orchestra, the job to be done consists in coordinating an already united multiplicity, a heterogeneous multiplicity, so as to produce the music. In Time and Free Will, Bergson speaks of psychic states of varying intensity, for instance, things like a feeling of heat or an intense anger or joy. In Matter and Memory, we then find what we might call the various functions of the self, things like perception, memory, the acting body, and affects. Here, self-constitution is the name I use for the process which coordinates this multiplicity, a coordination whose result is subjectivity in a sense, or what Whitehead might call experiential unity. Understood in this way, subjectivity is thus a constant achievement, sometimes more deep and complete than others, but always successful to some minimal degree. Um, so to describe this, I'll first go through Bergson's determination of the character of each of these things I've mentioned and uh, their relationship to Bergson's understanding of nature. So as matter and memory clearly states, perception, affect, memory, and the body must all be understood in terms of action. Our being in the world is first and foremost practical. Beginning with perception, Bergson tells us that it does not add anything to the world, but rather subtracts all those things which no wise alter the organism's capacity to act. Our, perceptions thus, our perception thus in a way delimits what Bergson calls the zone of indetermination that defines the organism and the universe. Perception is in this way intimately tied to our freedom. It is a reflection from the world of our possible action upon it. Perception, however, would be nothing without the body. If perception reduces the world according to our possible action upon it, it does so by relying on the specific measure of action or functional capacity of the body. For this is the sole office of the body. It does create representations in order to store memories. Bergson says this is the crucial teaching of matter and memory, that the body is a tool of action and of action alone. This applies to the brain in particular, which Bergson says is simply concerned with the transmission of movement. Like perception, the brain is an organ of freedom. Like perception as well then, the extent of the freedom marked by the brain is measured by the body's functional capacity. So as we can see from these two examples already, there is a constant relation in Bergson's thought between the organs of freedom and the body's functional capacity. With memory, we find a similar, albeit more complicated link between it and the body. On the one hand, Bergson describes two kinds of memories, habit memory and what is called episodic or pure memory, memory par excellence. Habit memory is evidently about practical engagement with the world, 
The pure memory, however, also holds a strong relation to the body, which is described through the famous figure of an inverted cone on a plane. Here, the, the relation is dialectical, but nevertheless, again, it is a relation determined by the sensory motor capabilities of the organism. As Bergson says, on the one hand, the memory of the past offers to the sensory motor mechanisms all the recollections capable of guiding them in their task. But on the other hand, the sensory motor apparatus furnished to unconscious memories the means of taking on a body. It is from the sensory motor elements of action that a memory borrows the warmth, which gives it life. And then finally, uh, turning to my main point of interest, affect, we find again this deep connection between action and the body. But the connection is seen, I think, perhaps here above all, almost to the point of coincidence. In Matter and Memory, Bergson defines affect as follows. He says, our perception of an object distinct from our body, separated from our body by an interval, never expresses anything but virtual action. But the more distance decreases between this object and our body, the more does virtual action tend to pass into real action. Suppose the distance reduced to zero. That is to say that the object perceived is our body. Then it is no longer virtual, but real action that this specialized perception will express. And that is exactly what aff affection is. Interestingly, however, this definition is in a sense the opposite of what was given in time and free will. Whereas here affect is defined in opposition to the virtual, in time and free will, affect as a function of the organic body is defined according to the virtual. Affect is implicated in virtuality to the extent that what affect is, is the body's report on what is tending to happen. While discussing pleasure and pain, Bergson says that affect, quote, instead of expressing only what has just occurred or what is actually occurring, points out what is going or tending to take place. The affective states must then correspond not merely to physical disturbances, movements, or phenomena which have taken place, but also and especially to those which are in preparation, those which are getting ready to be. So with this briefest of sketch uh, of some of the elements of subjectivity that Bergson considers, we can see how every single aspect of Bergson's subject is deeply implicated with action. This is the main lesson of matter and memory, but it was also already somewhat described in Time and Free Will, where Bergson explains that even our conception of space, time, and even language all result from a need to act in the world. As Frederic Worm says, Bergson's philosophy is thus both a practical and a theoretical pragmatism. Returning now to the idea of self-constitution, I argue that affect is an especially important phenomenon in this process. For if, as I tried to very briefly show, everything is to some degree coordinated around the body and its action, and affect is nothing else than the feeling of this body in action, then whether or not we define affect in terms of the virtual or solely in terms of the real, we might assume that it is through affect and affective feelings that these various elements that Bergson describes are unified. Bergson indeed says as much in Matter and Memory, where he explicitly describes the quote, centripetal process where the otherwise disjuncted and scattered perceptions are centralized around my body and create my personality. While this body, while this process is decidedly not intellectual, it isn't strictly guided by utility either. It is affective. And I'll quote a kind of a long Bergson quote. He says, our representation is at first impersonal. Only little by little and as a result of experience does it adopt our body as center and become our representation. The mechanism of this process is easy to understand. As my body moves in space, all other images vary, while that image, my body, remains invariable. I must therefore make it a center to which I refer all other images. I can see clearly how my body occupies the center, um, and I understand whence also arises the notion of interiority and exteriority, which is, to begin with, merely the distinction between my body and other bodies. My body stands is that which stands out at the center of these perceptions, my personality is the being to which these actions must be referred. So here we have kind of a, what I think is Bergson's very general characterizations of this process of self-constitution, or as I call it. It is a process of involution, as Levinas would say, a process that coordinates various elements into a center. A few pages down, Bergson then elaborates on how this happens. He says, quote, my perception does not go from my body to other bodies. It is to begin with in the aggregate of bodies and then gradually limits itself and adopts my body as center. And it is led to do so precisely by the experience of a double faculty, which this body possesses of performing actions and feeling affections. In a word, it is led to do so again by the experience of a sensory motor power of an image, 
privileged among other images. Um, there is then, uh, he says, excuse me, there is then a privileged image perceived in its depth and no longer on the surface, the seat of affection and the source of action. It is this image which I adopt as the center of my universe and as the physical basis for my personality. So beyond the simple feeling of the body in action then, affect is the fundamental event which serves to establish a living center for the organism in the world. Bergson speaks of this process as guided by, quote, the experience of a double faculty of performing actions and feeling affections. But if affect is the feeling of the body in action, then aren't the two experiences in some sense just one and the same? Isn't the experience of action not the precise definition of affect? I just quoted above. In this sense, we might say that Bergson develops an affect-based centripetal theory of constitution. At least that's what I mean by that. This is a bit unusual to say because of course, compared to other things like perception and memory, affect receives comparatively little attention. And yet, whenever affect is spoken about, things like this always come up. Perhaps the most surprising of all these moments for me comes in time and free will when Bergson is first using this metaphor of the symphony of the body. He's describing affect. There he says that, quote, it must be noticed that we rise by imperceptible stages from automatic to free movements, and that the latter differ from the former principally in introducing an affect of sensation between the external action which occasions them and the volitional reaction which ensues. So the difference is the uh, introduction of an affect of sensation. Indeed, all our actions might have been automatic and we can surmise that there are many organized beings in whose case an external stimulus causes a definite reaction without calling up consciousness as an intermediary agent. So notice what happened there. In the first sentence, Bergson describes affect as what makes a difference with free beings. But then in the second sentence, the intermediary agent is no longer affect. Now he just says it's consciousness. Um, and I'll, I'll, really, I'll spare you my terrible French, but it's, it's the same in the French. Um, so how, how do we explain this leap, the seeming equivalence here between affect and consciousness? Presumably, Bergson isn't simply saying that affect is equivalent to consciousness, for of course, the whole time and free will is dedicated to discussing consciousness in detail, while affect is only mentioned here and there. Rather, I think that what this little quasi-Freudian slip, as I see it, reveals is precisely what I think is shown in matter and memory. And that is that in Bergson's picture of subjectivity, affect plays a very crucial guiding role in this process. The switch here between affect and consciousness makes sense if we understand the process of self-constitution as guided by affect. So that's kind of the, the first part of my claim that affect plays the central, perhaps determining role in self-constitution and that there is such a thing as a process of self-constitution. Uh, and now uh, it gets a bit more complicated when I compare all of this to Bergson's idea of nature. In Bergson's thoughts, nature is entirely utilitarian. This is emphasized throughout his work in almost every description of the natural world and of its relation with the organism. For every one of the elements of the subject, which I mentioned above, we find a corresponding description of its relation with the natural world framed in terms of utility. Uh, the first description that Brixton has of nature as utilitarian occurs in time and free will, that same section I was just discussing above of affect. Affect, he says, cannot be a simple scientific report of what is happening in the organism because nature, quote, so profoundly utilitarian, quote, has no space for useless scientific reports. Utility is what also accounts for our distorted understanding of space and time. We see the world in this way because we need to in order to act. Similarly, matter and memory often describes the relation between human beings and the world in terms of need, biological need. The reduction that perception performs on the real, for instance, is not simply that allowed by potential action. Rather, the real is cut up according to the needs of the organism, needs now understood as that, which will as that which will conserve the individual or the species. As Bergson says, in the humblest living being, nutrition demands research then contact, and in short, a series of efforts which converge towards center. Um, the center is just what is made into an object, the object which will serve as food. It may be said that life will at once establish in matter a primary discontinuity expressing the duality of the need and of that which must serve to satisfy it. To establish these special relations is just what we call living. So like perception, memory too is often, but not always, defined in terms of utility. Bergson says, for instance, that, quote, the interest of a living being lies in discovering in the present situation 
that, that which resembles a former situation, and then placing alongside of that present situation what preceded and followed the previous one in order to profit by past experience. Um, these, those resemblances of contiguity are therefore the only associations that have a vital utility. So these are just two very quick examples of Bergson's double emphasis on need and utility when discussing the relation between the organism and nature. Um, but wherever one looks in Bergson's work, nature is always understood in this way as utilitarian. And the organism is said to simply relate to it, uh, to primarily relate to it in terms of its needs. The perceived world is what it is because of the biological needs of the human organism. Now, the crucial point in all of this is that the functional sensory motor capacity of the organism, which was mentioned above, is far greater in scope than the scope of the action required by an organism to fulfill its needs. In his recent book on Bergson, Mark Sinclair notes the same fact. He says that, quote, Bergson moves from the claim that bodily activity is involved in perception to the claim that perception is itself always a function of biological need. The first claim does not entail the second one, and Bergson does little to show that it does. Now, this all bears upon the issue of self-constitution, because if the process of constitution is dealing with a multiplicity always concerned with action, and if that multiplicity is coordinated by affect, then differing views on the nature of affect, that is its nature regarding action and biological need, would provide very different pictures of the self. If, for instance, affect is understood to be about utility, as time and free will states, then we would have a picture of the subject as a creature of utility. The problem with this is what Levinas will point out is that it's too much focus on utility renders too impersonal a subject, one that is devoid of true individuality and a meaningful sense of interiority. This would of course clash with the main purpose and insight of time and free will, which is the description of the essentially free being of duration. If on the other hand, affect is not about utility, as I think matter and memory sometimes suggests, then we have a very different picture of the self, one which however comes with its own problems. In this case, there would be an incongruity between the description of nature as utilitarian and the description of self-constitution, or if self-constitution really is guided by a notion of affect, devoid of the limits of biological need, the process of constitution would be less about procuring nutrients and cutting up the world according to this or that need, and more about simply attaining higher intensity of affect as such. In this later scenario, and here I anticipate what Levinas and Whitehead say, we find a picture of the world that is less an index of material needs and more a sort of a playground, for lack of a better word. For this view of self-constitution to work, our picture of nature would have to go beyond the limits or injunctions of utility and biological need and move towards something else. And this is what I claim Levinas and Whitehead do as a direct response to this issue in Bergson. So I turn to them next. Um, so in what remains, I'll, I'll give the, the briefest, most absurdly short of sketches of some of the metaphysics of these two thinkers and gesture to how these themes I've been discussing make their appearance there and how they are developed. So although they're quite different, both Levinas and Whitehead in their own way see the process of self-constitution as effective and importantly emphasize the immediate enjoyment of affect as what motivates this process. That is to say, in both Whitehead and Levinas, the organism's intercourse with the world is at bottom not one of utility, but one of enjoyment. Uh, so I'll begin with Whitehead. Um, in, the, in the very Baroque metaphysics of process and reality, Whitehead has two goals. He hopes to avoid what he calls bifurcation theories of nature, while also answering the ba basic question, how is it that novelty comes about? How is there something new? And his answer is in an important way that novelty happens through an affective process, like Bergson. For Whitehead, actual entities are the ultimate constituents of reality. These entities at their core what he call, are what he calls drops of experience. And experience in this sense for Whitehead means the feeling of other actual entities. So with Whitehead, we get a metaphysical picture similar to something like, like Nietzschean monads, but with the difference that instead of having no windows, Whitehead's actual entities are all windows. I think someone said that, I, I forgot exactly whose description that is. Fundamentally, the experience of these actual entities, and thus the most fundamental experience of all life, is affective. As Whitehead said it, says it, the basis of experience is emotional. The basic fact is the rise of an affective tone originating from things whose relevance is given. Novelty then results from a process of an actual entity feeling its world. 
This is what Whitehead calls prehending and thus changing from this experience. By changing, an actual entity creates a new disjunction in the world and now becomes itself the subject for prehension by other entities and so on. In this way, the possibility for transcendence is imminent in the world because of the very makeup of the ex and the experience of actual entities. And it is from the basis of the experience of actual entities that eventually something as complex as subjectivity can arise. This is why Whitehead refers to the project of process and reality as a critique of pure feeling. This is, in the sense, a philosophical exploration that, like Kant, seeks to describe the constitutive elements of subjectivity. The difference to the Kantian project being, of course, that what is to be critiqued now is feeling rather than reason. That from feeling itself, something like consciousness and mental life can arise. There is thus this reversal at play in Whitehead's thought, as he says. For Kant, the world emerges from the subject. For the philosophy of organism, the subject emerges from the world. Similar to Bergson, then, Whitehead describes subjectivity as a process whose achievement takes place through an intimate, affect-based relation with the world. Further, Whitehead is also adamant that such a process is not intellectual. The subject doesn't think herself into the world. She is rather the result of a complex, emotional, affective relation with it. Now, in my discussion of Bergson, I tried to very briefly suggest that we are presented with a theory of self-constitution that is based on affect, but that doesn't necessarily cohere, or at least doesn't require an understanding of the relation between the subject and the world in terms of utility. If affect es escapes relations of biological need, however, then how is it that affect can lead to this subjectivity? What is it about affect that gives rise to something like mental life? And it is in providing an answer to this question that I see Whitehead as a Bergsonian thinker in the way that I've been trying to present Bergson at least. For Whitehead, an actual entity becomes more complex because the pleasure inherent in the affective relation to the world grows in proportion to the complexity of the world that is available to be felt by that entity. In other words, the more we can perceive of the world, the more we can feel, and thus the more intense our enjoyment. This process of self-constitution is itself pleasurable for this reason. With the growth of complexity, there follows deeper intensity of feeling. As Whitehead says it, the characteristics of life are absolute self-enjoyment, creativity, activity, and aim. The enjoyment belongs to the process and is not a characteristic of any static result. The aim is that the enjoyment belonging to the process. The individual enjoyment is what I am in my role of natural activity as I shape the activities of the environment into a new creation, which is myself at this very moment. The aim at the future is an enjoyment in the present. It thus effectively conditions the immediate self-creation of the new creature. Uh, now, Hans Jonas, who was a follower of Whitehead and in my eyes, kind of a crypto Bergsonian, so to speak, explains it in this way. He says, intensification of feeling is a goal for it is intensification of enjoyment, which is itself rewarding. If there is an en actual entity called an electron, for instance, it has to have self-feeling. We have to distinguish what its function in the extensive continuum is. Its presence for the future and coordinated environment means something to be expressed in an equation. But there has to be also something pointing to what it means to be an electron. The external relations have to be supported by a being possessed by the entity. And this cannot be vacuous inertia, but a performance, a process of realization whose object and product is the entity in question. Thus, the theory of actuality is a theory of actualization connected with enjoying its own being. So that is um, Whitehead's affective theory of self-constitution, if you will. Mm. And we might say it follows some of the basic, very basic contours of Bergson's thinking in that it understands this process as resulting from a non-intellectual, perceptual, and affective relation with the world, but it also goes beyond it, leaving behind the focus on utility and maximally emphasizing the determining role of affect. Uh, and now I'll just end with Levinas. Uh, in him, we find a very similar idea, but it presented in an entirely different context. In his thought, affect is discussed in the context of a phenomenology of the elemental that was developed as a rebuke of Heideggerian thinking and that sets up the ethical moment of the encounter with the other. Levinas's critique of Heidegger is somewhat straightforward, uh, and it is what sets the stage for his own phenomenology of affect. For the Heidegger of being in time, the being of Dasein is care, 
Among other things, this means that Dasein exists in a world where things are primarily encountered not as objects of concern in themselves, but as part of a broader referential totality that lends itself to Dasein's general concerns. Dasein, that is, is a being that in its being is always concerned for its being. It's kind of impossible to talk about Heidegger without sounding like Heidegger. Um, for Levinas, however, this is a tragic utilitarian schematism that destroys any meaningful sense of subjectivity as it sacrifices all individuality and individual desire to a general concern for being. Hence Levinas' famous line that in Heidegger, Dasein is never hungry. Now, although he doesn't directly say this, Levinas' critique of Heidegger, I think also applies to Bergson, Bergsonian thinking in a sense. Uh, Bergson is just not mentioned so much, I think, because Levinas actually very much respected Bergson and he hated Heidegger. So I think he just didn't want to be mean, but the critique still applies. Uh, in particular, it applies to the Bergson of creative evolution, which I didn't go into too much, but also the Bergson of time and free will and matter and memory. In the moments when he understands the relation of the organism to the world in terms of utility and the exigencies of the species. As Levinas says in another discussion, his problem with Bergson is that Bergson's work tends towards quote, an impersonal pantheism that doesn't sufficiently note the crispation of the self, unquote. This means that for Levinas, a utilitarian understanding of the relation between the organism and the world can never be adequate because it has no room for the individual subject, no room for individuality proper. For Levinas, thinking in terms of biological utility always has this drawback. Now, like Whitehead, Levinas redresses this problem, problematic utilitarianism by proposing an affective theory of self-constitution that is centered around the notion of enjoyment. This is perhaps the most overlooked part of Levinas' thought, but it is a part of his phenomenology that the ethics depend on. For in order for the other to interrupt and place me in question, as they do in the ethical moment, uh, there must first be something that is interrupted, and that something is enjoyment. Levinas speaks of the relation between the organism and the environment as a relation to what he calls the elemental. And the elemental for Levinas is the basic medium, what he calls the milieu of life. A milieu is grasped neither as representation nor as a tool implicated in a series of practical finality. Rather, the elemental is experienced as pure quality, Levinas says. One doesn't grasp it, but one is steeped in it. The experience of pure quality is the experience of sensibility. It is affect. As was the case for Whitehead, affect and sensibility are then for Levinas primary experience. They are prior to knowledge and representation. Likewise, the intentionality that sensibility establishes with the elemental is primarily one of enjoyment. And, and enjoyment is the, Levinas's word is jouissance, which in English doesn't have the same full meaning as enjoyment, but that's how it is. Uh, sensibility is thus ultimately nothing else. As Levinas says, one does not know, but one lives the sensible qualities, the green of these leaves, the red of this sunset. In its very gnosis, sensibility is enjoyment. Furthermore, in the intentionality of affect and in, of enjoyment, one relates to the world corporeally. But this also means that one's primary existence before being implicated with abstract knowledge or finality is one marked by need. Levinas says, quote, the body naked and indigent is the very reverting, irreducible to a thought of representation into life, of the subjectivity that represents into life, which is sustained by these representations and lives from them. Its indigence, its needs, a firm exteriority is non-constituted. So following Levinas's line of thought, we might find with needs, the reason why enjoyment is constitutive of subjectivity. Our relationship to the elemental is described as a relationship to pure quality. Immersion is not something to be possessed, whether in thought or in hand. It is something simply experienced, and experience in this case is always embodied. The relationship to the elemental, which constitutes embodiment through sensitivity, is the experience of need. Need, however, as a phenomenon prior to representation or finality, as the event of embodiment, is outside of any reference beyond itself. The fact of enjoyment thus instantiates the subject by virtue of the ontologically primary structure of self-reference that defines it. Steeped in the milieu of the elemental, the sensible body refers only to itself, at once positing and enjoying the satisfaction of its needs. And in what sounds like a direct response to Bergson, Levinas summarizes this as follows. He says, quote, the care for nutrients is not bound to a care for existence. The inversion of the instincts of nutrition, which have lost their biological finality, mark the very disinterested of man, 
the suspension or absence of the ultimate finality has a positive face. It is the disinterestedness of joy and of play. To live is to play, despite the finality and tension of instincts to live from something, without this something having the sense of a goal or an ontological means, the simply play. In enjoyment, things revert to their elemental qualities. Enjoyment is thus produced as a possibility of being precisely by ignoring the prolongation of hunger into the concern for self-preservation. Here lies the permanent truth of hedonistic moralities, to not seek behind the satisfaction of need in order relative to which alone satisfaction would acquire value, to take satisfaction, which is the very meaning of pleasure, as a term. As Levinas says, the affective state is thus the vibrant exaltation in which dawns the self. For the eye is not the support of enjoyment. The intentional structure is completely different here. The eye is rather the very contraction of sentiment, the pole of a spiral whose coiling and involution is drawn by enjoyment. The upsurge of the self beginning in enjoyment is the exaltation of the existence as such. So in, in this picture, needs for Levinas don't refer to the concern for being that is characteristic of Heidegger or perhaps even Bergson's thought. Embodied needs refer simply to their immediate satisfaction. And it is because of this that the process of self-constitution is deemed affective. Freed from a notion of utility, affect is, for Levinas as well as for Whitehead, and perhaps maybe for Bergson too, what guides the process of self-constitution. As Levinas says, what is termed an affective state does not have the dull monotony of a state, but is the vibrant exaltation in which dawns the self. So just to end, um, what I've tried to do here is kind of draw this sort of small constellation that I said, tracing a line between the ideas of affect, self-constitution, and nature in these three thinkers. And in doing so, I, I fear perhaps that what I've presented is not quite Bergsonian, but maybe also not quite Levinasian or Whiteheadian either. Important metaphysical differences between the three make this comparison risky. Nevertheless, whether this be a Bergsonian reading of Levinas and Whitehead or a Levinasian reading of Bergson or whatever, there is a commonality of theme that I think these three thinkers deal with that connects them in this interesting way. One small benefit of drawing such a peculiar constellation is that it might liberate us from two strict labels that sometimes attach to these thinkers. If we insist on calling Levinas simply a phenomenologist, for instance, or Whitehead simply a process philosopher, we might miss such similar themes, the same problems and solutions that they all develop. Whether or not this is faithful to one or the other, I hope to at least have presented in this little constellation what Whitehead would call an interesting proposition. For Whitehead, an interesting proposition is the most important kind of proposition because as he says, whether or not they are true doesn't matter as long as they serve as a lure for novelty, an occasion for thought, and thus to contribute to the creative advance of the world, or at least hopefully in this case, to the creative advance of the global Bergsonism project. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Miguel, for your excellent presentation. I think we have uh, many material to, to think about. And I open the, the questions, uh, the space for questions. We have uh, uh, Rob Leon. Rob Leon, I don't, don't know how to pronounce it. Oh, excuse me. Okay. Oh, no worries. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you both so much for your papers. Um, I apologize, but my question is primarily for uh, Melanie. Um, and my question is whether your examination of laughter's relation to sympathy has offered any additional insight to the relation of intelligence as Bergson treats it, um, which often butts head with sympathy. Um, I say that only because in the first chapter of the laughter essays Bergson, he, he refers to laughter as something intelligent, um, especially because of how it silences our emotions, especially pity. Um, so there's this great congruity um, between your account of laughter returning us to sympathy and the ability to sympathize and Bergson's account of intelligence in the two sources returning us to pure obligation or restoring to pure obligation its force um, in the closed society at least. Um, and you also drew attention to tension and relaxation, which Bergson, I mean, he, he applies this distinction everywhere, but especially, especially in the, um, he predicates those of the intelligence in the intellectual effort essay, which was written around the same time as the laughter essays. So I was just wondering if, um, yeah, if you had anything to say about intelligence. Uh, 
This is this is a wonderful question, um, a wonderful question that I'm afraid uh, I won't be able to answer um, because the uh, quick response is uh, I haven't developed it uh, thus far. But I think that your observation about the status of intelligence, particularly with respect to laughter, is an interesting one because I think um, uh, one of the choices I made in preparing the talk was not to enumerate the various kinds of comic forms that uh, Bergson discusses and presents in each of the essays. Um, but there is certainly something intellectual in some of the forms insofar as wordplay or otherwise actually reveals something, something of the of the intellect. Um, but I think what inspired me to give pause was uh, in, in the very uh, final essay um, in Laughter, there is his meditation and discussion where he kind of brings everything together. And he, re he reflects on the fact that intelligence is this which is not, uh, pardon me, that laughter is such that it is not necessarily reflective. And hence laughter in and of itself is not just. And it's that that I think gives us some indication of the kind of social role or social context that laughter and hence intelligence uh, need, to, need to work through. Um, but I so like your question because it gives me the next uh, step or the next building block to advance my um, my thinking, and I'm just sorry that I wasn't able here to give you something meaningful. You've given me something in return, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we have Larry. Larry, Katarina, and after Bruno, for instance, for, for the moment, okay? Great, thank you for that presentation, Miguel. I'm Larry McGrath. My question is, why affect? Uh, what motivates your interest in this concept? And if it is, as I suspect, due to the resurgence of affect studies right now across the humanities, what does Bergson's concept of affect have to uh, contribute to other theorists of the concept? Uh, great, thank you. Um, good question. <laughs> I'm, I'm not exactly sure, to be honest, what, what drove my interest to affect. I think. Um, it's, it's something that, at least to me, remains maybe vague enough uh, and un undecided that it kind of piques my curiosity. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what affect is, to be honest, even most of the time. I think Bergson says the things that I said it is. Um, it's, I think it, what's interesting about it is that it, it seems to be an open space that lends itself to much thinking. So I think one thing that um, Bergson can lend at least to, to the recent discussion on affect theory, which I'll admit I'm not super um, well versed in, is this idea of, of kind of self constitution. When so, from the what I know, the discussion of affect, for instance, I'm, I'm thinking of the uh, I forgot his name. What, what is this? Uh, the, the person who talks about affect and the virtual, who I believe is in, in Canada. Uh, he, Edited. Ryan Masumi. That's right, uh, Masumi, thank you. Um, so Masumi, for instance, does a very interesting analysis of affect in relation to politics, the economy, all kinds of things. And I think what um, maybe what Bergson can lend to these discussions is kind of that through affect, he allows us to implicate the entirety of the, say, the self or the subject, or whatever you want to call it. It kind of uh, allows for um, to see in a deeper way how the world and the subject are in this kind of relation of determination that is not simply perhaps um, determinant in any kind of straightforward way. I think what Masumi points out with regard to affect, which I find fascinating, is it's um, how things like pleasure and pain don't always match up with happiness or sadness, for instance, sometimes. 
And so he says, we enjoy our pain or our sadness. And this is what affect allows us to do, to explore kind of these strange boundaries. Um, that, that's sort of my interest in it. Um, it doesn't feel like a excellent response, but um, that's, that's what I take from it. Thank you, Larry. It's a good, too good a question again. <laughs> Okay, it's all right, Katerina. Yes, thank you. Thank you both for these um, uh, uh, talks. It's been very interesting. And uh, uh, I would like to um, make a question to both of you. Um, in the horizons of questions that were um, opened at the beginning of our day together by um, the first panel uh, with the uh, Dipesha Chakrabarti and Frederick Borms. So I'm sorry, Melanie, you weren't, you weren't there, but we were um, talking about um, the problem of uh, humanism also. So also the, the, the role of uh, uh, the human species among the others and, uh, and also the, um, uh, the tension between our own life as individual lives and uh, life in general that uh, uh, creates uh, big issues in ethics and politics today and uh, that we can see in <laughs> richly <laughs> developed in, uh, in Bergson's philosophy as well. And I was um, very interested in the way you have uh, driven us from um, from the laughter to two sources uh, uh, um, following the, the, the topic of uh, sympathy. And um, I didn't understand if you, um, if in your reading, the sympathy is uh, mainly positive. So that could lead us mainly to social cohesion, social <laughs> sharing and open society, or if it has also an ambivalence uh, and could also be instrumental to a uh, closed uh, uh, form of sociability. So in, on which side does uh, sympathy uh, stay? And, um, and I would like to ask to Miguel um, uh, something that's also in this same horizon of, uh, of problems. Uh, um, because you have um, insisted a lot on the role of effect, of affectivity uh, in self-constitution. Um, in, in the three authors you have uh, um, considered. And did you find uh, also a role of effect in social or in trans uh, uh, individual constitution? I think as good Canadians, we're perhaps waiting to see who might want to answer first. May I jump in? Go first. Um, uh, such a lovely question. Um, I think, um, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to clarify. Um, and I think that the clarification comes in the sense that it's my view that the conception of sympathy that is developed in each text works profoundly in the context of a different context. So in two sources, for instance, sympathy is and social cohesion is something that is taken for granted. It becomes um, something that is assumed through um, and by virtue of the obligations that we have and maintain through the force of pressure with, with one another. But one of the things that is so interesting and in laughter is that, and this is, you know, perhaps um, a function of, of my own personal meditation on our current times, is that social cohesion isn't taken for granted. Um, it is something that has a danger, a risk, a challenge associated with it. The way that Bergson articulates that challenge is uh, by virtue of the absent-mindedness of the individual or um, the uh, sense of, a, of somehow not quite fitting in 
And the iconoclast is always someone who um, challenges the internal uh, cohesiveness of a society. And consequently, laughter is the mechanism that is used to, to bring that individual back to the fore. So in, in that context, then, the kind of sympathy that emerges will be, will be different. Um, uh, sympathy in and of itself, and, and I think this uh, uh, actually answers directly our question, I don't think sympathy in and of itself can lead progressively to the open society, but rather the, the kind of sympathy that's articulated in laughter vis-a-vis -vis the kind of sympathy that's articulated in two sources is a response to different uh, social problems. Um, in two sources, that threat is external. The threat is the externality posed by a war and the defensiveness um, of the group in the face of an enemy. But in the context of laughter, the social problem that one faces is the somnambulism or the sleepingness of a society that somehow um, has lost, lost its way. And laughter functions as a means of bringing the individual who somehow um, expresses that uh, sleepiness or somehow thwarts the uh, background expectancies of society and brings, it, uh, brings that individual back to the fore, or at least as an attempt to do so. Uh, okay, so I think on, on on my end, perhaps my the less interesting answer regarding Bergson, I think the the role of affect perhaps is somewhat covered by what Melanie has said, and the let's say the the social constitution of affect would involve this feeling of um, that laughter speaks about it, kind of shame as a social corrective or something like this. Um, I think for the, at least the way I think of what first comes to mind when thinking about the affective role of social constitution, it would be more in terms of Levinas uh, and what, what I talked about before. Um, I think that, so as, as the, the role that I kind of tried to describe that affect plays in his thought is that um, affect or kind of the, the situation of enjoyment, which is the affective situation, is what sort of lays the groundwork for the appearance of the other and for the ethical moments, let's say. And so for Levinas, he says something like, um, the other uh, comes when, I, when I'm faced with the face of the other, there is a call of responsibility. And I have a I feel a need to account for myself. And in particular, I, I feel a need to account for my enjoyment. Right, there's something like um, this kind of experience that one, where, where, where before one sort of has to, um, before the other one has to explain oneself, whereas one didn't previously. Now, in, in connection to what was said this morning, uh, this is not a well framed thought, but what I was thinking about is in terms of the, like the environmental thinking and the destruction of the world and stuff like this. Um, the, if the situation of our relationship with the environment is sort of, let's say, the precondition for the ethical moment. And if Levinas defines that situation as a moment of enjoyment or affective, then it's, it's a kind of very concerning or worrying what you might imagine. What would happen if, if that originary situation of enjoyment is now one of, say, chaos, pain, want, starvation, natural disaster, things like this, when the you know, if affect is this key moment that sort of allows for self-constitution that upon which then social constitution, let's say, is built, then something we, I could imagine like the, the destruction of the natural world in which we live in would perhaps put that original feeling of responsibility that is the ethical moment in doubt, maybe. If there is no enjoyment, then what, then what against the appearance of the other, the the call of responsibility might, might be changed in some way. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure if this is a great answer, but that's kind of what comes to mind. I think the, you know, the, the relationship with the natural world 
suffers and if so does enjoyment and so might self-constitution which might lead to something like social social decay perhaps or less social cohesion things of this kind thank you for a great question thank you okay. and we have uh, uh, bruno a question from bruno and alia and teno and uh, after this uh, we can't uh, finish okay uh, and Bruno. Okay. Well, thank you both for the amazing talks. And actually, I have a question for both of you. Uh, the first one is from Melanie. Uh, it's, I mean, I'm very happy that you established this link between the laughter and two sources because I think it's it's fundamental. And usually we, we, we read two sources based on creative evolution, but I think there's a, like a, you know, a secret path from the laughter that, that takes us to, to sources. And my question is that you mentioned in your talk a lot of times in uh, uh, a pessimistic tone in the laughter. And I, I would like to know if you think that uh, this pessimistic tone is balanced at the end of the book, uh, when when there's a kind of uh, a static optimism, so when he because it's, it's more I'm thinking more the, on the difference between the comic and the drama, the tragic, the, the, the tragic that he established at the end of the book. So, do you think that this like a static optimism? in uh, uh, the laughter balances the, the pessimism, social, the social pessimism. And do you think after, after that, if, 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 you, if you think that in the two sources, uh, this optimistic, th this aesthetic optimism turns into a social optimism with the possibility of the open societies. So that will be more or less my, I don't know if I, I, I express myself well, um, and to Miguel, I, I, I just, I mean, I, I just remember uh, James Sully, he wrote a book on la laughter. Uh, I think it was an American psychologist. Okay. And he criticized Bergson of not um, thinking of the laugh, uh, of laughing as a spontaneous gesture. So he, he says, oh, Bergson, Bergson's analysis cannot uh, fully grasp, for example, the laugh of a baby when it's born, I mean, when a small baby, because the laugh has nothing to do with, uh, 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 with the social constraints that the book, the laughter tries to establish. So, and after, uh, I think some years before the publication of Two Sources, that's when he starts to think about the concept of joy you know in opposition of the need so he he, he established some opposition between jo joy and need but he 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 doesn't go further so I, I'm, I mean I was because you you said that Levinas for example criticized Bergson because Bergson thinks of need right life as need and not joy so what do you think of that? Do you know of these passages of Bergson theory? Do you think it will, be, it will fulfill this, you respond as critic? I mean, just, just a okay. thought. Thank you. Uh, you can go ahead, Melanie, and I'll gather my thoughts. <laughs> uh, um, thank you. I wish we could have a global, global Bergsonism conference every week. And um, because given, given uh, these wonderful questions, um, I don't have a preformed answer to your question. So my observations, I think, will come out in stammers and starts, but hopefully we'll get somewhere. Um, I. I took the crux of your question to ask about the evidence of a pessim about the uh, the perspective of a pessimism that I present in laughter and to contrast that against the spirit of optimism that he lends um, 
lends his analysis to in the development of the aesthetic or the art of the dramatist near the end of the, the last essay. And I think, and note the tentativeness, I think that I would say perhaps, but perhaps not in the sense that it overcomes or permits the possibility of leading us to an, an open society. I think what it does is to point to the fact that uh, laughter is a per uh, viewed in the way that uh, Bergson does it he offers a functional analysis of laughter. He looks at the way that it works. And so consequently, um, he doesn't necessarily speak to the question of its spontaneity, et cetera. I'm just picking up the thread of the, of the second question that you had for Miguel. But to me, it seems that given the constraints of that kind of functional analysis, what happens is that there is indeed a balance. It's, but that balance is always internal to society. And so society may experience a balance between uh, those who are, uh, who comply, those who oblige, and laughter may have functioned in order to return the errant individual. But I think that the pessimism of which I speak and that I read in, um, in laughter is always aware of its limits as a tool and a weapon. So I don't think, I mean, so it's interesting the, the visceral, the effective reality of laughter, it pales in comparison to the experience of joy that, um, or of, of love that um, he develops so beautifully in two sources. And so that's not to say that laughter isn't powerful, but I, it must, I guess it depends on what it's, what from a functional perspective it is seeking to do or to accomplish. And I think that it can serve to unify and to make co uh, cohesive, but it can't withstand the threat to the kind of external threat that Bergson articulates in the context of two sources, if that makes sense. It's inadequate to that task. I mean, one might say, ah, yes, we can laugh in the face of the enemy, but that is itself uh, reflective of a certain kind of pessimism. That's, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, okay, so also thank you for uh, a very nice question. Um, and I think it's, it's sort of um, this opposition, let's say between joy and need is perhaps uh, just to jump back to what Larry mentioned, th this is maybe why I'm mainly interested in in affect, I think it the what what I find to be interesting about Bergson is that he he does have this sort of need based approach to the self and stuff, but it, it's it's not uh, always there. He also has these passages of joy. Uh, I, I'm not exactly very familiar with the the later stuff that you mentioned, but even from time and free will, th there's already a discussion of joy, deep sorrow, uh, specifically joy in there. And um, so what maybe part of what I was trying to get at a little bit is that Ber Bergson, um, it, he's a bit vague. He, he kind of, these two positions are, are in his text simultaneously. And it's that um, ambiguity perhaps, which is open and what allows Levinas and Whitehead to kind of develop what they do in this sense. In, um, in Time and Free Will, it is actually when I first had this kind of thought about speaking of, uh, let's say, something like self-constitution or the coordination of psychic states uh, was when reading the sections of joy in Time and Free Will. And even then, Bergson says that if we think, he, I think he's trying to um, 
described the heterogeneous multiplicity of the psychic states. And he says, imagine uh, the progression of how we come to experience a deep joy. First, we might feel kind of a little bit happy. And then I think he uses a metaphor, like it starts to glow and it kind of, it's like a, I forget the word, but it's like a contagion. And then everything, all of a sudden we feel lighter. The same perceptions just feel more pleasurable. All of our psychic life kind of takes on this, this characteristic. Um, so I think the, it, it is, you know, Bergson himself does even from the beginning talk about joy. I think the, what he just doesn't do is, or at least he doesn't seem to do in the early work that I mentioned, um, let's say pick sides between that and need. He, he doesn't maybe see a contradiction that Levinas and Whitehead do seem to see between uh, joy and a philosophy of nature. But I think this, this is kind of like um, a fertile kind of ambivalence, let's say in Bergson. The, the joy is there and it's, it's very much determining uh, parts of his thought and how he describes mental life. Uh, so, you know, I, I, to, to not answer your question, I think it's like yes and no. <laughs> uh, Bergson does have the joy and he also has the utility and, and maybe he doesn't think it's a problem. So, but it's, yeah. <laughs> because it's a common critics uh, right. from the phenomenologists, right? I mean, Heno Babaha, he will critic the same the same aspect, right? So, I'm... yeah, no, and I think um, th th I think this is also part of why. I mean, it, it's it's good to not read Levinas just as a phenomenologist, for instance, and or sometimes some these people and kind of these labels because phenomenology does have this this criticism. But then it's, you know, I think the, the, their response to the criticism is also Bergsonian. I mean, it's, it's there in his, his whole thing kind of comes from there. So it's kind of a, an interesting ambiguity or multiplicity, <laughs> Bergson might say. Thank you. Okay. Then we have a question of Al from Alia in after we finished. Okay, Alia. Okay, thank you both for your um, papers. And I am asked to be brief, so I'm gonna just, I had a question for Melanie, but I'll just ask you that. I'll send that to you later. So um, this one is, is brief, but it comes back to this question of affect and need. And it, it just struck me that I didn't have that reading of the passage from Matter and Memory at all, because affect and need are not separate it seems to me for Bergson. And that distinction comes from, I mean, I, I think it does come from a phenomenological, uh, I'm sorry, there's a cat, right? That's very <laughs> restless. <laughs> um, the, uh, that distinction comes from a phenomenological outlook that would bracket the biological, but the biological, but biological need and affect go together for Bergson because the, the way he brings it up is with pain. It's, and pain should not be read, I think, as simply something biological, because the biological is not simply biological in Bergson, right? So there's, there's something much more going on in that passage, I just want to note. And then if you take uh, the action on, so life is action on matter in, as a simple sort of outline in uh, matter and memory, but it's also the creation of possibility. And so all of that, um, uh, the, the way in which need and affect come together in uh, both sort of the, a, a reading that would be utilitarian, I agree with you quite commonly is utilitarian when it comes to matter, but also has to do with the creation of possibility, doesn't really uh, jar with a distinction, which seems to be imposed from a different perspective. So the ambivalence might not be so much ambivalence as in a more genuine sort of um, way in which need is seen as something much more than we would normally say biological need is. Um, and so, so it's, and I think that would go along with like accounts of hunger as something much, um, much more effectively um, uh, rich as a concept than, than just something that's there for survival. So hunger and desire go together in, in many ways. So that's just a, so this is all obviously for Miguel, sorry. No, that, that's great, thank you. Uh, in, in the spirit of keeping it short, uh, I'll be as, as brief as possible, but um, so I, I think uh, you're right, uh, of course, um, in, in the sense that 
for Bertsona affect, um, the, the distinction between affect and need is not as clear as you say in the discussion of pain, that there is this connection very clearly. I think uh, where, where I was perhaps finding the, the ambivalence, maybe, maybe I'll have to look at it again uh, after thinking about this more, is in the, in the kind of change of definition between time and free will and matter and memory regarding affect. Whereas in time and free will, in the discussion of pain, affect is very much tied to virtuality or the, the, what is coming to be and Bergson explicitly ties it to need. But he, he then changes it and he says, affect has nothing to do with potential action. It is merely about real action. Um, so I, I think that that's where I, I took the, the perhaps ambiguity from, but I see what you're saying, maybe to think more of, of uh, the possibility and the distinction between matter and life is, a point well taken. Thank you. So I'll consider more. Thank you very much.